most of mental health lobbying is we want what they have. We being the underfinanced public mental health system want what they, our primary care brothers and sisters have. We're angry because we have so many fights uh, that we must pursue in order to give our community the dignity, the respect that they deserve to be well and to be loved. Those are the voices of Gordon Levine, CEO of the Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance, and Al Guida, advocate for mental health public policy, both in the fight to create a movement for systemic change to improve care and support and equity for those with schizophrenia and psychosis, and to fight for a cure. Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. Finally, a place to talk about the truth. Welcome to episode 76. Tonight, we're going to have an episode that Mindy and Mimi and I have been talking about doing for a long, long time, talking about schizophrenia as a treatable brain disease. And we've got just the guests to tell us all about it. This is Taking Action with the Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. Mindy Greiling is on the board, and we're bringing in, in a second, Gordon Levine, who is the CEO, and Alfonso Guido Jr. Did I say his name right? Well, ask him when he comes on, because I make there's mistakes a, like anybody a, a else. at the end there instead of an O. I think you said Guido, but there's... Guido. Guido. All right. Well, I will correct that later. Um. Anyway, <laughs> before be, before we bring them on, Mindy, last time we did we did a podcast. Your your Jim had had a bit of a a relapse. Is he doing better? Uh, thank you for asking. I'm so glad that he is doing better. You know, he I think he just absentmindedly took too much medication. But then when he wasn't feeling well, he added some more things on to that, and then he had seizures. But luckily, we worked with his doctor, who you know is Dr. Robert Leitman, also on the board of Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. And he's all perfect now, as perfect as he's going to get. I met with uh, Jim and I meet with Dr. Leitman together, and we did it yesterday afternoon. We had his blood levels. Everything is tip top again. And Jim is blowing out his birthday candles just a few minutes ago. Aww. His birthday was yesterday. My husband Rogers is tomorrow. So we're so happy that that we're back in gear for the birthdays and for life. That's wonderful. And as all our listeners know, it's it's a roller coaster. It's there's many, there's many games and none of them are fun, but, uh, you know, it's good that it, what sometimes what goes around comes around and we consider ourselves lucky when it does. So I'm really glad Mimi, by the way, is traveling again. She was hoping her plane would take off late so she could join us from the airport, but it was on time. So we have two moms in the trenches and we're going to bring on Gordon and Al in a moment. As my listeners know, what we're going through here is, um, this pre-trial, period in minimum security jail for my son, my first time being the mother of an inmate. And uh, it's it's been interesting because he sounds more like himself right now than he has in a long time. And I think it's because he's making friends. I think being with 55 other people and like he says, well, I'm doing I'm doing pretty well considering I'm in jail, but he's also, my son is so sweet. And he's like, it's my friend's birthday and we're going to make ramen noodles for a surprise birthday party for him. So I've been in the process of collecting letters, character reference letters about my son, who I, I call Ben for publicity purposes. And that has been so heartwarming and also so heartbreaking for me to get all these letters of support from all these people who love him customers that he used to wait on at the restaurant where he worked, the management of the restaurant, the manager of another place where he worked. And it's so heartwarming to see how many people care. I was able to collect 11 letters and friends of mine. And, uh, you know, I just hope it affects it. I hope it gets the public defender and the judge to see a clearer picture of who he is and that we get him some help 
instead of a sentence. So that's where we are. Cause that's know. wonderful that people came through for him. Yeah. And you know, doesn't that say something though about our mental health system that he's making friends and has a community in jail. Yeah. Maybe if he'd had that on the outside, he wouldn't be there. Yes. And maybe if he'd accepted it, because mm -hmm. what's interesting, there's something called choice fatigue when you have too many choices and you just can't make choices. And, you know, we'll be talking, actually, Alan Gordon and I were talking about, you know, uh, people's rights. And we talk about that a lot, but sometimes I feel like my son does better when he doesn't have that many choices. And right now where he is, he, he's told when to eat. He's told who he's going to live with. He can pick and choose his friends from among them. He's told when it's playtime. And I actually feel like not being able to say no actually puts him in a position to make the most of the situation. That's just my armchair psychology. But anyway, so we're okay. He's safe. I'm going to see him on Saturday. Took a while to get a visit. And that's where we are. So thank you. And I, Mimi will tell us next time she comes up. So let's talk about, now, is there a shorter way to say schizophrenia and psychosis action alliance? S-N-P-A-A. -A. All right. So S-N-P-A-A -A has a vision. And that vision is to see schizophrenia and psychosis spectrum disorders universally recognized and treated as neurobiological brain illnesses. And the mission is to create a movement for systemic change in order to, yes, please, improve care, support, and equity for the millions of people living with schizophrenia and psychosis spectrum disorders. So that's and, and, I, and I'm going to say when we get Gordon on here, maybe the first thing we can ask him is we just had our annual meeting uh, last weekend in Texas, and we changed both of those things that you just read, the vision and the mission. So I think they're even better. So Gordon can tell well, us what they you know are what? when he gets here. Let's bring on, uh, turn on, please enter and turn on your cameras, please. <laughs> <laughs> Al and Gordon. Al, please say your name correctly for me. So I don't. Randy, it's Al Guida. Guida. So yes, ma'am. Guido, because I wrote it wrong. Guida. Okay. Yes. Awesome. I wasn't that far off. So I'll just keep right, my mistake in there. Because I'm a human being. All right. So, well, why don't we just start off by telling us the new mission? Sure. And and thank you for having us. And certainly we are grateful for all of the advocacy and awareness uh, that all of you have been doing for all of these <laughs> previous uh, podcast episodes. Um, we look forward to this conversation. Um, so the Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance has been around um, since about 2008. We actually go a step farther back if you uh, trace our history even uh, to uh, 1985 um, in Michigan uh, with the Schizophrenic uh, Anonymous organization, which was a peer-based support group, uh, which morphed into uh, the Schizophrenia and Related Disorders Alliance of America, which then about two years ago in uh, March of 2001, changed into SMPAA or Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance, what cuts across all of that time horizon is our unwavering commitment uh, to support those living with schizophrenia and psychosis. And obviously over that time span, um, we have learned a thing or two about um, how our um, messaging is resonating, where the science is going. Uh, and as Mindy suggested, um, we actually um, refocused uh, and, and um, modified our vision and mission slightly, not abandoning anything that you read. All of those things are still very much true, mm -hmm. um, but we um, we wanted to highlight some additional aspirational goals and some very specific areas where we think we can have um, short-term impact. But the long-term vision is to cure schizophrenia. Um, without that, none of this um, really matters, right? But in, in the meantime, uh, a cure is not going to happen today or tomorrow. It's gonna take some time. Um, and, and, and the medical and scientific experts would tell you in order to quote, have um, the, the definition fulfilled as a cure, you need to have both disease modifying therapeutics, plus you need to have preventative measures. We don't fully have either, um, but we believe that the science is becoming strong enough that it's not um, out of the ballpark to aim for those things, initiatives like 
um, a biomarker initiative that our organization is a steering committee member at, at the NIMH um, to find uh, biomarkers for schizophrenia. And for, uh, in case everybody doesn't know, National Institute of Mental Health is NIMH. Exactly. Um, so we think the science is there to say um, very confidently that um, cure is possible with more in, um, investment in science and research, of course. Um, but until there's a cure, there is recovery. And our mission is to um, try to remove all of the systems level barriers that exist, which are plentiful. They're, they're in every direction uh, for those living with schizophrenia and psychosis. But we also know that um, there is proven techniques, um, therapeutics, social support systems, et cetera, um, that can enhance and support people for meaningful recovery. And those are the things that we're going to be pursuing and all of the wraparound um, education, research, care and support and advocacy and policy um, that is required to be successful with all of those things. Wow, and we did just... have a little bit of um, disagreement, not a lot, but about when we changed our our vision to curing schizophrenia. Some people were like, you know, can you actually cure it? But we came around to an almost unanimous decision. And that was because there are so many people that that think it isn't even treatable, you know? So if you have this huge vision, even if it's five years away or 40 years away, as someone said, it's really, um, it gets people to thinking they, we really should accelerate. We should do something. It's just a, a really, I think, um, markedly different and so much more proactive and positive of a vision. I just, um, I love it. And I first, when I first saw it, I had to pause too, because I thought, eh, I don't know if Jim is ever going to be cured, but listening to the people there that have more research knowledge than I do, I came around and I really, um, I think it's, I think we are doing really good work at this organization. Can I just say, in a way, I feel like I'm interviewing the three of you now, like I'm, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, what I'm feeling as the mother of someone with severe schizophrenia and, and, you know, Mindy and I were talking before about character letters I'm collecting for my son. I'm sure you guys heard it because you were, you were listening. These were not letters from before he was ill. These were, some of these people have known him before his illness took hold, but these were letters when he was successfully being treated with a medication that worked the best for him. He spent nine years. These are letters of how well he was functioning, even with schizophrenia, with proper treatment. As Mindy and I were saying, you know, 65% of who we could have been, I'll take it for now. But when to hear the word cure just brings tears to my eyes. Yeah. When you say four or five years, I'm like, bring it on. That is nothing, you know, to aim for that. That is just so exciting for me to hear your mission as it was and your mission as it is. Now, now, Al, you've got more than three decades of experience in health, public policy, and government relations, and you're both in our nation's capital. You're a top strategic thinker. And you're adept at advancing legislation and public policy. So, so what is, I think I can guess, but what is your role with SNPAA? And so really, I've, I, you know, I've helped to represent SNPAA on Capitol Hill, as Gordon has indicated, for about five years now. And so one of the debates on Capitol Hill now has a direct relationship to your son's uh, current situation. Um there's an active debate on the finance committee, which governs Medicaid, uh, about um, Medicaid coverage for uh, inmates uh, in uh, state prisons and county jails. Now, um, that doesn't sound like a mental health or addiction treatment specific policy, but it is because of, there's such a high incidence rate for mental illness and substance use disorder uh, among individuals that are uh, that are in custody yeah. or that are in our in our nation's um, penal systems and and I'm sure you've discussed this um, in previous editions of your podcast but essentially we reinstitutionalized um, 
what was a uh, a population that was served in 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 state hospitals in our nation's penal system. So uh, I think the the Cook County jail system and the Los Angeles County jail system and the New York City jail system uh, trade places seemingly in terms of operating the largest inpatient psychiatric hospitals in the United States. Uh, so, so I, I'm, so I, I got you. I, I, you know, I mean, as a matter of fact, I was raised by a man with schizophrenia. My father had, uh, had, uh, had schizophrenia. That's why I'm in this business. That's why I've dedicated most of my professional life to advancing public policy in the mental health and uh, addiction treatment space. So I've, I, I've got a, you know, some understanding of what you've been through trying to raise this young man. And I'm sorry that he finds himself in the in the circumstances that he's now in. And unfortunately, he's living the life that many, many people with schizophrenia live, which is behind bars or in some kind of an institutional setting. And I'm right. I'm sorry about that. I really am. Thank you. And you know, it we're we're hoping that because this is all pre-trial, it's just it's pre-trial. So they are working really hard to get him into a jail diversion where he'll get substance abuse and mental health help. Uh, that's an interesting process that I'm learning. And we did, if, if, uh, for our listeners, we did interview Elisa Roth, a, a New York Times journalist who who wrote the book, Insane America's Criminal Treatment of the Mentally Ill. So we, if, if you're interested in learning more about that specifically, that's a couple of episodes back. So, um, Mindy, I'm going to ask you, uh, grab a question and ask it in light of what you would most like all our listeners to know about SNPAA and, and where it's going, where's the hope? Well, I would most like listeners to know that um, that it's an organization on the rise. You know, there's ebbs and flows of nonprofit organizations that people start with a lot of passion. And Gordon kind of went through our history, and I've only been on the board a couple of years, but um, it's gone through a lot of iterations. But I feel like with this uh, retreat that we had, our annual meeting in Texas this past weekend, that we have arrived where we're on the cusp of doing the most important work that we've ever done. Um, we are We've been kind of a research organization. And, you know, as you know, I'm a former legislator. And when people come forward to policymakers with research, I always think that's really good. But I always ask them then, how do you want to apply that? What do you want us policymakers to do? And that's where I think we're just arriving. So I know Gordon can talk more about that. But before we get to that juncture, I just want to bring in the... Um, the, the the event that we had last spring that I think was kind of a catalyst for us to get more at, into advocacy. And that was the Angry Moms event on Capitol Hill. I was back here in Minnesota at the NAMI National Convention and I had a chance to sell books there. So I'd already been signed up for that before this one got scheduled, but I hope to be there next year. And maybe Gordon and Al can talk about that and then um, also talk about some of our plans for, for another one coming up this year. Gordon. So we exist because we are trying to shine a light on the realities of those living with schizophrenia and psychosis. We also know that in order to be effective, we have to translate real world experience into fact-based arguments. So a lot of our research, we don't do biomedical research, however, we do support um, biomedical research approaches, things that like the National Institutes of Mental Health, um, AMPS, Accelerating Medicine Partnership for Schizophrenia and the Biomarkers Project. But in-house, the types of research that we pursue, total cost of schizophrenia in the United States um, study that we did about two years ago, which basically um, talked about the total economic impact of schizophrenia of $280 billion to the United States across all domains of, of daily living. Um, is meant to give flight and focus to advocacy. Because what we know is the existing policies and laws nationwide are dramatically inadequate to supporting this population. Um, so our intention is absolutely, we have two words in our name um, that I wanna highlight. 
action and alliance. We want to do stuff with people. And we absolutely do not want to go solo. There's this whole thing in the nonprofit world about um, working together. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? We think it's an essential thing. Um, and we're, we're, we can't do this alone. But we also realize that there are, there are places that we can focus that perhaps larger organizations, either for whatever reason, aren't able to take the lead. Um, they can be a secondary or, or a third in line. Uh, all in under the same umbrella working together. In other cases, we're not the lead. We're, we're number three on that list, but we're all rowing in that same direction together because we, we can't do everything alone. But what we want to do is, is shine a light. We want to be nimble. We want to be fast. And we want to be honest about the overall systems level problems and barriers that exist. So this, this event last May. So it happened to be World Schizophrenia Day uh, during Mental Health Awareness Month, which is May. Um, it'll happen again next May. Um, but we as an organization um, had never done a focused, we had had an event in Capitol, uh, Cap on Capitol Hill before, but actually flying a lot of advocates in to, to go visit their local uh, elected officials um, and to, to really press forward with key legislative priorities is something that, that is essential. Uh, and we look forward to doing that again in the future. And it's too bad Mimi isn't here because we did have Sue Maida on for a program who started the Angry Moms. And Mimi Feldman was actually in Washington at that event. The picture that that um, SNPAA has on the website of the moms who were there, Mimi's front and center uh, with her big smile. So that was just a a cool organization. And I don't think it would have happened with just the angry moms. It took the SNPAA being nimble and per working with Al, who has the smarts to connect ev everybody and make all those office visits on Capitol Hill. And it also took um, a lot of fundraising from from SNPAA to make that happen. You can't just get into those rooms and without um, without all that that planning. So Al, mm -hmm. do you wanna add anything to that about yes, the uh, events? I, I, I would. So, so Randy, uh, uh, it was a, a dynamic partnership between SNPAA and the Angry Moms. And, and so what I would say is it was dynamic. So it was sort of good news and bad news, right? So the good news is it was, uh, it, it was, it, it was a terrific show of advocacy. And I think it had an impact. Uh, it generated a, a, a dear colleague letter on Capitol Hill directed at the Food and Drug Administration um, uh, uh, regarding uh, attempting to improve access to a 40-year-old generic antipsychotic medication. Okay, so... So, you know, so therein you can say what it is. Therein lies the therein lies the challenge. It's it's uh, it's clozapine. Right. And so therein lies the challenge. Right. So the fact that the fact that that the that the one of the best medications on the market to treat persons with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder is a 40 year old generic medication is an indication that. Our, our pharmaceutical that that we haven't advanced in the armamentarium necessary to properly address the clinical the day to day clinical needs of these individuals. But having said that, it was it was a wonderful show of advocacy, and it produced a result which forced the FDA to respond. As a matter of fact, then Gordon and I were uh, you know on Capitol Hill today on the Senate side trying to approach the Senate Mental Health Caucus regarding the exact same issue with a follow-up letter to the FDA on the exact same, uh, on a follow-up piece of advocacy in an effort to force the agency's hand to produce more access to this vital medication, which the agency, uh, for in, in a misguided way, as far as we're concerned, is uh, narrowing access to uh, this life-saving drug. So the fight goes on to uh, reduce or eliminate the REMS for, for clozapine. And <clears throat> we invite you to hear our episode with the Angry Moms, but Angry Moms is 
History is full of angry moms and we can't do it alone. We need partnership, like you say, working together. So I'm curious about two things. One, Al, you have shared that you grew up with a father who had schizophrenia. So I, that may be fueled your passion for this. Gordon, I'd like to know if you have a similar story that fueled your interest. And then I keep going back to hope. Like when you say we're looking for a cure, can you say more? I know you're not a biomedical company, but you are working. Can you can you tell us where the hope is? Like where, just give us an idea of what sort of research could lead to treatments that are different from from what we have now. I mean, I heard at a NAMI conference that the schizophrenia treatment or mental health, mental illness treatment is where like cancer treatment was 50 years ago. It was like chemo or nothing. And what will get us, what will get us past that? So Gordon, if you would just share, if you have a personal story first, and then can we talk about cures? And sure. So like, like every family in the United States, my family has been touched by severe mental illness, um, severe depression, OCD, um, bouts of psychosis. Um, so it's very personal and very real. I also have um, experience professionally um, with different conditions, Alzheimer's, autism, ALS. Um, so I have a lot of nonprofit um, insights into how other patient advocacy organizations have built the cause um, to be as effective as possible. Um, in, in terms of hope, um, so our organization led a broad coalition. We did it with NAMI, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, National Council for Mental Wellbeing, Mental Health America. We were the lead organization to organize what the FDA calls the Patient-Focused Drug Development um, Initiative, uh, which has been around for about 15 years. And in many different um, conditions, there is um, a, a focused, dedicated day um, where the real world um, evidence of that particular condition is brought to light in a panel presentation, a pre-meeting survey. Our shorthand PFDD, Patient Focused Drug Development Meeting, occurred one year ago, almost to the, to the day, next week. Um, and it was the first time that schizophrenia had ever been highlighted in this way. Uh, there were 63 staff from the FDA there. And in, in a year of preparation for this meeting, it took it that long to do. Um, what we discovered was through some pretty detailed analysis, if you look at central nervous system conditions um, and you look at the number of clinical trials that are in place for the different you know, uh, conditions that fall under that CNS umbrella, schizophrenia was number two, right? Alzheimer's is very high, a lot of, a lot of action going on. Schizophrenia was number two about 60 ongoing clinical trials. Now we, we, we started looking into that, like how does that compare? And, and some of our advisors said it's robust. Now, thank God it's robust because there hasn't been anything um, novel, innovative, disease modifying. We've got these 40 year old, 30 year old, 20 year old antipsychotic medic medications with a really lousy side effect profile. We need, oh, yes. desperately need new therapeutics. And what we were able to amplify is what matters most to patients. Do you really want to gain a hundred pounds and, and, and not be able to easily get to work, not be able to cook dinner, not to be able to go on a date, drive your own car? No, that's not a meaningful, thriving lifestyle. So we were able to highlight what matters most to our, our community and to advocate. And I'll, I'll tell you with, without, you know, saying which which is going to actually be approved, no one knows. But th there's an existing um, late stage um, mm -hmm. review uh, for CAR XT, uh, which is actually going to be focused on an entirely different brain receptor, um, which is differentiated. So the fact that, without saying whether one is better than the other, we don't know. Right. But what matters is there's innovation going on in the pipeline. Uh, that there's over 50 clinical trials. Like if that doesn't give your hope for better stuff, I'm not sure what does, but we also know that we haven't fully optimized what is already in, you know, in the toolkit, so to speak. That's why we're so focused on removing barriers um, related to things like clozapine. And there are other issues with other medications where you can't find a prescriber. The prescribers haven't been fully you know, trained on some of the realities of what works best for people living with schizophrenia. And then you got the whole 
reimbursement and payer landscape, which adds additional complications to it. So there's just education all around that has to take place. So how I, one thing I've been, I, I know I'm on this board, but I would like to hear the history. You know, you went through all the uh, different, like I said, ideations of this group, you know, with passion, mental health groups spring up here and there, and then some consolidate, some fade away. And you said, uh, I liked what you said, Gordon, about um, action alliance. You know, we're about taking action and we don't always have to be the lead. Obviously, NAMI is the big um, organization, the big gorilla in the in the pool. And I was on that board um, uh, 20 years ago. And then we did focus on uh, serious and persistent mental illnesses. But over time, that uh, that group has gotten to be, they kind of bragged about at one time, I heard somebody bragging about we're all things to all people with mental illnesses. And um, so I see this group focusing on schizophrenia and psychosis related disorders as really important because the fo there's just not as much focus, I don't think, on people with schizophrenia. And I think that's the viewpoint of a lot of our listeners. But could you talk about how we do work with NAMI um, because alliances are important and are there other organizations that SNPAA works with and how do we do that? Sure, so, so our approach is we've got a handout to anyone who will accept our hand. Um, in, in, in the last several years, um, NAMI uh, and, and our organization have, so we are both steering committee members on the Accelerating Medicine Partnership for Schizophrenia Project. That's a five-year initiative. Uh, we're going into year four uh, together. Um, we also have a, a handoff relationship. When you call the NAMI helpline and someone says, I've got symptoms, my son has symptoms of schizophrenia, I'm concerned. Uh, we are their referral partner to our helpline um, for trying to provide additional support. Um, we also um, work uh, on policy related issues uh, together. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a lot of, of collaborative um, intentions. Um, however, we also know that because they're very broad, right, they, they can't be all things to all people. And, and, and certainly there are roles um, and, and activities that make more sense for us to lead under our banner, which, which we are proud to do. But we also know that the scale and, and the sheer size of an organization like NAMI is very useful to leverage. Um, and there's a willingness at the most senior levels of both organizations to do that. That, that's and, fantastic. And Mindy, Go if ahead, I can, yeah. I, yeah. on this clozapine issue, so in addition to the Angry Moms, Gordon uh, created a relationship with the uh, American Association of Psychiatric Pharmacists and the AAPP. As a matter of fact, we team with them on the briefing and Dr. De uh, Deanna Kelly from the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy was on the Hill with us today. So Gordon's very good at creating these relationships both in and outside the mental health community to advance your agenda. Wow. I mean, Fantastic. Is, you know, you were mentioning a little bit, Al, but I, in case our listeners missed it, I think it's just this week that the Senate, the U.S. Senate started a bipartisan mental health caucus with two uh, Republicans and two Democrats. And so I'm really proud that one of those senators is uh, Senator Tina Smith from my state of Minnesota. And so I know that we're, uh, I've called and we're going to be talking with her, I think, on a Zoom meeting perhaps uh, soon. Good. So I, I consider that like so wonderful to get to talk to my senator with this or wonderful SNPAA that I serve on the board for. But could you give us a peek at how it went with your meeting with one of the other chairs, I think the one from California? Uh, how did that go today? It went well. And Mindy, if I could say, so I look at I'm, you know, I've got gray hair here, as you can probably <laughs> see. And uh, I've been a mental health lobbyist, for better or worse, uh, for the best part of 30 years. And so there's a through line throughout those 30 years. Uh, members of Congress that are willing to lift water on behalf of mental health and mental illness have a have a family member with an access one 
severe mental illness, an immediate family member. That goes back to Senator Pete Domenici from New Mexico and uh, Senator Paul Wellstone from Minnesota uh, back in the 90s, all the way through Senator Gordon Smith from Oregon, had a son that uh, completed suicide uh, through Lynn Smith from Michigan, Congresswoman from Michigan, to today. So um, Senator Padilla, the, the senator we met, the Democratic co-chair of the, of the Senate Mental Health Caucus, his mother-in-law um, has... By has a combination of bipolar disorder and schizoaffective disorder. An SNPAA board member uh, that lives in California saw a San Francisco Chronicle article, and the article that that discussed the senator's personal history, you know, discussed their first date uh, uh, that the senator had with now Mrs. Padilla where she discussed her her mother's battle with schizophrenia, with, with schizoaffective disorder and bipolar disorder. And the article seemed to suggest that the mother-in-law is on clozapine. And we brought that up today in the meeting. So it went pretty well, all things considered. That's um, wonderful. And- Talk about nimble and serendipitous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yes, and then- you know, the Republican co-chair is Senator Tillis from North Carolina. So Senator Tillis had a had a medical surgical condition. He was being treated with steroids. It, it was a steroidal treatment. And then that triggered, the steroid treatment triggered mania. So it, you know, it triggered mania. So, and and then, you know, apparently then it, then it, it, it basically it was, it, it mimicked bipolar disorder. He both had mania and then uh, major clinical depression for a period of two years, as I understand it. And so uh, that's, that's why he co-chairs the Senate mental health caucus. So, so it's, so, so these are new members uh, that have stepped out and, and by the way, Randy, Mindy, these acknowledgments would have ended political careers when I began this 30 years ago. Mm. Some of us of my age and so, maybe so, so. yours, Thomas Eagleton, we all uh, remember what happened to him. He had to drop out running for um, national office because of just depression and that he had seen a therapist. You know, I mean, that not to mention... Um, if someone, I mean, I don't even know if it was a, a long-term mental illness, but that just knocked him out. So let me and say two it, final it's So it, it makes me feel very good to hear bipartisan and a committee filled with people to whom this situation is humanized. I, we can all agree there are some crazy things happening in Washington right now. And part of that is that the truth isn't there. They're just seeing opinions. They're seeing opinions on social media. But when mental illness comes home to you, to your family, it humanizes it. Mm -hmm. And now you have to go, wait a minute, this is a real problem. Let's talk about facts. And (laughs) that makes me feel very glad to know that you were there that there are lawmakers there that care. Um, Hold on a second. So I I would like to ask you, if we have listeners who are going, how do I get involved? What can I do? How can I help SNPAA? Is there, can they join as a member? Can they engage? How can our listeners who want to join this fight, what opportunities are there for people to get involved? There's a couple of different ways to get involved. First and foremost is we want to be here to help, right? So if you or anyone who you um, have in your family, your friendship circle that is looking for any type of support, education, um, 
information uh, for schizophrenia and psychosis, we're here. Um, we're not 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, but during normal business hours, we even check on weekends, um, reach out to us. Uh, we have support groups for those who are either diagnosed themselves or their care partners. Um, and we have a lot of resources we'd like to provide. That's number one. Num number two, um, we're a nonprofit organization. And like all of them, none of us exist without uh, the support of the public and those who um uh, believe in our mission uh, through financial donations. Um, that's essential. The third thing is we do want to create a movement for change. And, you know, someone mentioned the angry moms and, and you in the trenches and to, to carry forward the analogy, uh, you know, I'm an angry CEO. Al is an angry government relations specialist. We're angry because we have so many fights uh, that we must pursue in order to give our community, the dignity, the respect um, that they deserve to be well and to be loved. Um, so we have a ton of work that needs to be done um, and we need all the help that we can get. That's amazing. Uh, I think the last question would be, what haven't we asked you that you would like us to know and how can people get in touch with you? I think that the question, uh, if I were sitting in your in your seat, um, would be, how long is it going to take? You know, you, you talk a good game. You got this cool vision. It's aspirational. It's the moonshot. Um, but you're more practical because you're, you're pursuing recovery um, in all of its forms, whatever that means. But how long? Like, I look, look you guys know very well, there, there's not a second that goes by where you're not thinking about the impact is your son or daughter okay mm -hmm. um when will i hear from them again um and that's a very stressful um experience so so when is all of this so-called change going to happen and while al and i can't sit here and give you an exact day and time and year there's there's a lot to be paying attention to the fact that that we can walk through the corridors of of congress and have elected officials, Senator Fetterman's another great example of someone who has actually been hospitalized and, and can come back to, to the halls of Congress in a bipartisan way and talk about that experience. And we're talking about schizophrenia and, and what has traditionally been the scarier forms mm -hmm. of mental illness to the fact that people are actually listening and not running for the hills gives us hope. Um, you're going to see progress from the clinical trial perspective. There, there's a, like I said, one of the medications is going to have the final readout of phase three in a couple months. Um, you have a whole host of other phase three and phase two new therapeutics that are right behind it. Um, you have all of this action going on on Capitol Hill. And we know um, if you look at bipolar and eating disorders and depression and anxiety, broadly speaking, the fact that you have Hollywood and and just part of our normal course of, of action these days, people freely talking about these traditionally taboo topics, you're going to see that come toward toward our side of, of the fence pretty soon as well. So I, I've never felt in the history of our organization um, more hopeful than what we're going to see in the next two to three years. Um, and that's still too slow, but I think things are quickening. The pace is, is moving faster. I love that. Thank you, Al. Anything you want to add? And maybe you can also add like the name of your website and all that as well. Oh, uh, we're at, we're at, at guideconsultingservices.com and, uh, or pardon me, guidelobby.com, guidelobby.com. So Randy, I would also concur with, with Gordon. And look, I, <laughs> what I would say is again, I've been at this for a very, very long time and public attitudes have changed for the better over those three decades, without a doubt. The, the, the public dialogue and discussion about mental health more broadly is, is absolutely extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Now, uh, has it caught up to individuals with severe and persistent mental illnesses? No. The the, there is much less stigma associated with uh, clinical depression uh, and anxiety 
uh, than existed in the past. Um, uh, but I think we're making progress and certainly uh, discussions among public office holders, among celebrities, uh, you know, among uh, uh, chief executive officers about mental health issues. It's, it's unprecedented in the time that I've been doing this work. So that leads me to some hope uh, that we can generate the resources necessary to, uh, to uh, expand the public mental health system. Gordon has been talking about the scientific development. My, most of my work is trying to generate the, the Medicaid and related financing for a radically underfinanced system. Most of mental health lobbying is we want what they have. We being the underfinanced public mental health system want what they, our primary care brothers and sisters have. That's that's 90% of what I do. Uh, and and so the I really do think that that these changes in public attitudes is and we really saw this demonstrated during COVID is generating a sea change that helps with the advocacy in this space with respect to the resources that the system needs to be able to better support uh, Randy, Mindy, your children. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, and people and like the, your and father. And the millions the of people with schizophrenia that, you know, that live in the United States. Well, as they say, from your mouth to the legislator's ears, I think I played with that phrase a little bit. I know you're fighting. <laughs> you're, you're with us fighting the fight. I mean, truly living the alliance part and the action part for schizophrenia and psychosis. And I thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And so it's guidelobby.com. Dot com and the Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance, that's the same website or is it's there a different website? It's SCZaction.org. SCZaction.org. We'll put that in the show notes as well. And you've just heard it. And Mindy, any final words? I just want to thank you both so much for joining us and for your work. I echo what Gordon said. I've never been so hopeful about and else about schizophrenia in general and um, Gordon about this SNPAA organization. I think just like our podcast, we're not afraid to say schizophrenia, three moms in the trenches. And we have, you know, tons of listeners. We do nothing but grow and grow and grow. And we wouldn't have probably wanted to, you know, hang our hats on that word. Uh, 20 years ago. And now we have this organization, Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. We're proud that that's what we're working toward and that's who we're working toward. So it gives that alone gives me hope. But all the action that's coming is, is incredible. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're Schizophrenia Three Moms in the Trenches and two men of action with organization behind them that gives us hope. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.